What Happened at Lake Crescent by Julie. I've always been drawn to the serenity of Lake Crescent. Its waters, deep and impossibly blue, cut through the heart of the Olympic Peninsula like a slice of sky fallen to the earth. I went there seeking quiet, a break from the incessant buzz of city life in Seattle. My plan was simple, a weekend alone with my thoughts, my camp stove, and the endless whispers of the forest. The first night was exactly as I had hoped. The sky stretched clear and star-filled above. The fire crackled like a companion, and the loons called mournfully from the lake's far shore. I went to sleep with my tent flap open, lulled by the soft lap of water on stone. But the second night, the fog came. It rolled in from the west, thick, swallowing the trees at the paths and noise. The world seemed to shrink to a bubble of dim light around my fire, which now seemed as much as a beacon as a source of warmth. As the night deepened, so did the fog, until I could barely see the lake's edge just 10 feet away. That's when I heard it, a whisper. At first, I thought it was the breeze, the way it can mimic voices as it rushes through the leaves, you know. But then it came again, clearer this time, threaded with the unmistakable lilt of somebody calling a name. My name. I stood, heart thudding strangely in my chest. Hello? My voice sounded thin, devoured by the fog. The whisper came again, closer now right at the edge of the water. Julie, come. I don't know why I followed it. There's something about the human mind, isn't there? A curiosity that not even fear can fully dampen. I found myself drawn toward the voice, stepping cautiously over the wet stones, my flashlight's beam swallowed by the fog. As I reached the water's edge, the whisper became a chorus, dozens of voices, all soft, all beckoning. And then I saw them, shapes in the water just beneath the surface, shadows of houses, a church steeple, the outline of what might have been a market square, a town drowned and forgotten, but remembered by the lake. I stumbled back breath catching in terror. The legends whispered my whole life that I just brushed off, said that there was a town swallowed by the lake after a landslide in the early 1900s. These stories flooded back to me. They said the town was lost, all lives claimed by the water. But they also said that on foggy nights, those souls reach out for the living, hungry for company. The voices still sighed, but the spell was broken. I turned and fled back to my camp, to the remnants of warmth from my dying fire. The next morning, the fog was gone as if it had never been. The lake was placid, innocently reflecting the dawn sky. But I couldn't shake what I had heard and seen. I packed up quickly and left, the echo of the whispers trailing me as I went. I haven't returned to Lake Crescent since, Sometimes, at night, I still wonder about those voices. Were they truly the souls of the lost, or just the lake playing tricks with the fog? Maybe it's best that I never really know. The Shadow of Mount Rainier Living in the small town nestled at the foot of Mount Rainier, I had grown accustomed to the mountain's moody presence. It was a silent giant, commanding awe and respect with its snow-capped peak and sprawling wilderness. I often hiked its trails, seeking the solace that only the dense woods could provide. One chilly October afternoon, with the sun slanting low through the autumn leaves, I decided to explore a trail I hadn't tried before. It was less popular, 
a narrow path that delved deeper into the heart of the mountain than most. The trailhead was marked by an old wooden sign, half eaten by moss, the name barely legible. As I walked, the forest closed in, the trees older and closer together, the air cooler and tinged with the scent of pine and damp earth. The path twisted through towering firs and thick underbrush, and with each step, the silence deepened, as if the mountain itself was holding its breath. About two miles in, I stumbled upon it, an old cabin, its gray wood slats barely holding together, camouflaged against the backdrop of aged trees. It was odd finding such a place here, unmarked on any map. Curious, I approached, the floorboards creaking under my weight as I stepped onto the porch. I knocked, but of course, nobody answered. Habit, I suppose. Inside, the cabin was like a time capsule, dust-laden and filled with belongings that suggested a sudden departure. A coat hung by the doorway, a pair of boots, a table set with two plates, now holding only the remnants of a meal long consumed by time. On the mantel, there was a series of black and white photos showing the same cabin, surrounded by people in early 20th century dress, smiling, unaware, it seemed, of whatever fate awaited them. The real discovery, though, was on a small worn desk in the corner, a diary, its leather cover cracked. I flipped it open, the pages yellowed and fragile. The entries were written in a neat, looping script, starting off cheerfully with tales of life at the mountain's base. But as I read on, the entries grew darker, more paranoid. The author wrote a feeling watched, of eyes that followed from the trees, of whispers in the wind that called their name. They wrote of the mountain's guardian, a presence both protective and possessive, one that did not appreciate the encroachment of humans. The last entry was frantic, scribbled down with a trembling hand. It spoke of making a final trip to the summit to confront this guardian or to plead for peace. The entry cut off abruptly. No goodbye, no resolution, no closure. I left the diary as I had found it, a chill running down my spine. Outside, the light had begun to fade, shadows lengthening and turning the woods around me into a place of whispers. I just couldn't shake the feeling of eyes upon me, watching from the dark spaces between the trees. I hurried back down the trail, the sense of being followed persisting until the trees thinned and the edges of civilization crept back into view. Looking back, the mountain stood impassive, its secrets cloaked in shadow and silence. Since then, I have hiked many trails, but never that one again. And sometimes at night I dream of that cabin and that guardian, wondering if the diary's author ever found what they were looking for, or if they simply became another part of the mountain's lore. The mountain does keep its secrets, and perhaps some paths are meant to remain untraveled. The Fog of Forks The road to Forks, Washington has always been shrouded in mystery and mist. It was famous for its endless rainfall and dense forests. It seems a place caught between the pages of a storybook and reality. Driving back from a friend's wedding, the night wrapped itself around me like a cold, dark blanket. The only lights were the beams from my car, cutting through the fog that crept across the road, a living thing, or so it seemed. This part of the drive was always eerie. Trees lined the road so closely it felt like moving through a tunnel, sculpted from branches and fog. My headlights caught the mist, turning it into a swirling, ghostly dance. 
I had always dismissed the local stories of strange sightings as just that. Stories. But that night, something felt different. The air was charged, a static hum that raised the hairs on my arms. As I rounded a bend, my headlights illuminated a figure standing right in the middle of the road. It was a woman, her clothes out of time. A long, flowing dress, her hair loose around her shoulders. She didn't move, she just stood there, staring directly at my approaching car. I slammed on the brakes, my heart leapt into my throat, and I skidded to a stop just inches away from her. But when I blinked, she was gone. I rubbed my eyes. There was no trace of her, not even a disturbance in the thick fog. I even rolled down my window and looked around, but she was nowhere. Shaken, I drove on, slower now, my eyes darting to the rearview mirror, half expecting to see her sitting in the back seat or something. The rest of the drive was a collection of odd shadows and the distinct feeling of being watched. Every rustle in the woods seemed amplified. Every animal cry sounded like a whisper. When I finally made it through the town limits of Forks, the fog began to lift, but the feeling of unease did not. At a diner in town, while sipping on strong, bitter coffee, I mentioned the encounter. The waitress, a lifelong resident, nodded as though she had heard this type of story before. She leaned closer, looked around like she didn't want to be heard, and then said, You saw her then? The Lady of the Mist? You know they say she walks the road looking for her lost love, died in a car accident on that bend in the 50s. Oh, they were supposed to be married that day. Every so often, they say she appears to drivers, always on foggy nights. She patted the table, looked at me, and then walked off. Chilled, I left a tip and walked out into the early morning light. The sky was just beginning to clear. The logical part of my mind wanted to dismiss all of this as fatigue, a trick of the light and fog. But as I drove out of Forks, passing the spot where I had seen her, I felt a chill, and I just couldn't help but wonder if maybe there was more to the mist than just water and air. Maybe, in places like Forks, the past never really lets go. And maybe, I had seen a ghost. The Midnight Ferry from Bainbridge Island I always loved the peaceful quiet of the late night ferry ride from Bainbridge Island to Seattle. It was a time to unwind, the city's skyline slowly emerging from the darkness like a constellation of earthbound stars. I had made this trip countless times, usually finding myself among a sparse crowd of late commuters and the occasional group of tourists. But one particular night, something was different. It was just past midnight, and the ferry was more deserted than usual. As I settled into my usual spot on the upper deck, I noticed a group of people standing by the railing. They were dressed oddly. Their clothing seemed to belong to another era. Women in long skirts and men in sharp waistcoats and hats. What struck me most was their silence. They spoke not a word to each other, just stared out across the dark waters of the Puget Sound, faces somber, eyes fixed on the unseen horizon. They seemed out of place, like figures stepped out from a black and white photograph. Curiosity overcame my initial hesitation. As I approached, trying to catch snippets of conversation, even though they weren't really having one, I realized they were completely silent, unnaturally so. It was as though they were surrounded by a bubble of silence, the sounds of the ferry's engine and the lapping waves even muted around them. The ferry staff seemed to pay them no mind, walking by without a glance, as if the group wasn't even there. Feeling a chill despite the calm weather, 
I pulled out my phone and tried to snap a picture. But when I looked at the screen, the spot where they stood was empty. No figures, just the night and the softly churning water. I pocketed my phone, puzzled and more than a little unnerved. As the ferry docked in Seattle, I watched the group closely, expecting them to file out among the other passengers. But they didn't. They simply vanished, disappearing as the ferry emptied. Later, unable to shake my encounter, I did some digging. I learned about a ferry, the SS Bainbridge, that had sunk near the island in the 1930s after striking a submerged object. It was a tragic tale, many lives lost in the cold waters, not far from where we had sailed that night. They said that ever since, on certain nights when the fog lay thick and the moon was a mere sliver in the sky, those who perished rode the ferry once again, making the journey that they couldn't finish in life, staring out at the waters that claimed them. The next time I took that ferry, I watched and waited, half expecting to see them again. But the deck remained empty, the usual chatter and clatter of passengers filling the night air. Perhaps they had moved on, or perhaps they only appeared to those who needed to see them. Maybe they were just a reminder of the veil between past and present, and how thin it can really be. As the city lights welcomed me back, the skyline bright and bustling, I couldn't help but feel a connection to the city's hidden histories, to the silent passengers whose journey was eternally unfinished. And every time the ferry's horn sounded into the night, I listened just a little more closely, a part of me forever scanning the dark waters of the sound. The Haunting of the Seattle Underground Becoming a tour guide for the Seattle Underground was a dream come true. I had always been fascinated by the hidden underbelly of the city, the remnants of old Seattle that existed beneath today's busy streets. The underground passages, once the main roads and first floor storefronts of old downtown Seattle, were abandoned after the Great Fire of 1889 and the city was rebuilt on top. Now, they offered a glimpse into the past world, preserved just beneath the feet of the oblivious city above. My first day on the job, I was a bundle of nerves and excitement. The underground is known for its cold, shadowy passages, and, of course, its ghost stories. I learned the stories by heart, eager to share them with wide-eyed tourists. As I led my first group down the damp, echoing corridors, my flashlight swept over the old brick walls and wooden door frames that framed the darkness. The tour was going well. The group was engaged, jumping when I told tales of the mischievous spirit said to haunt the underground. Like the infamous Shoeless Joe, a cobbler who, legend had it, still searched for the boots he'd left behind in the rush to escape the fire. I pointed out the places where visitors reported sudden cold spots or felt unseen hands push them gently on the back. It was near the end of this first tour, as we gathered in a particularly narrow passageway, that I noticed it, a soft sobbing echoing through the corridors. It was so faint at first that I thought I had imagined it. I glanced at the faces of the tour group, but no one else seemed to hear anything over my stories. The sobbing, though, grew louder, more distinct. A mournful, heart-wrenching sound that seemed to seep from the very walls. Curiosity overcame me. I excused myself from the group for just a moment, following the sound down a fork in the passageway that wasn't usually included in the tour. The air grew colder as I walked, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. The sobbing led me to a small, hidden room, half collapsed, the floor covered in old, wet newspapers and discarded objects from a century past. As I showed my flashlight around, the sobbing stopped abruptly. The room was empty. 
no one was there. The silence that followed was oppressive, heavy. Shaken, I hurried back to the group, wrapping up the tour with a laugh and a joke, trying to shake off the eerie encounter. That night, as I locked up the underground, the corridors empty and silent around me, I heard it again, that soft sobbing in the distance. This time, I didn't follow it. I left quickly, the echo of my footsteps a rapid staccato in the empty passageways. I've led many tours since then, the underground always a source of fascination and fear. But sometimes, when the light fades and the shadows lengthen, I still hear that sobbing, a lament for the past, perhaps, trapped beneath the bustling city. And I wonder about the stories hidden in the darkness, the tales of those who lived and died in the world beneath the world, their voices just waiting to be heard. I keep listening, a part of me always walking those damp corridors, waiting for the past to speak again. The Pine Street Apparition Living in downtown Seattle had its perks. The vibrant nightlife, the coffee shops on every corner, the eclectic mix of old brick buildings and sleek modern towers. It was a feast for the senses. But even in such a bustling metropolis, there were stories that made you look over your shoulder. Tales whispered between the clinks of coffee cups. One about the Pine Street apparition. I had always dismissed these stories as urban legends, mere spooky tales to entertain tourists and newcomers. That was until one late evening while walking my dog Max around the neighborhood. The streets were quieter than usual, the fog from earlier in the evening settling into a thin mist that hovered over the pavement. As we turned onto Pine Street, I noticed a figure standing at the corner of Sixth and Pine. She was wearing a long flowing dress, looking distinctly out of place against the backdrop of neon signs and modern hustle. In her hands, she held an old photograph, her attention fixed upon it, like nothing in the world existed. The soft glow of the street lamp illuminated her face, revealing tears streaming down her cheeks. I approached her, my dog Max stiffing cautiously at the air. Are you okay? I asked, keeping a respectful distance. She didn't respond. She didn't even acknowledge my presence. As I drew closer, ready to reach out, she simply vanished right in front of me but she left behind the photograph on the ground where she had stood. Baffled, I picked up the photo. It was an old black and white image of the very building I lived in, dated 1911. The building looked newer, grander, with people standing in front of it, dressed in the fashion of the time. In the photo, the woman in the flowing dress was there, her arm linked with a man wearing a bowler hat, both smiling happily. I hurried home, Max close at my heels, the photograph clutched in my hand. Over the next few days, I just couldn't shake off the image of the woman or her sad, silent tears. I started digging into the history of my apartment building. I learned that it had once been a grand hotel, a beacon of luxury in early 20th century Seattle. The woman in the photograph was Eleanor Rigby, the daughter of the hotel owner, who was supposed to be married in the hotel's grand ballroom. However, tragedy struck on her wedding day when a fire broke out, claiming her life and those of many guests. Now that I know her story, every time I pass that corner at night, I can't help but look for her. I wonder if she's still searching for the happiness that was so brutally snatched away. Sometimes the air seems to grow colder there, the lights flicker, and I feel profoundly sad, as if the past refuses to be forgotten, and maybe good for it. Eleanor, the Pine Street apparition, remains a reminder to all of us of the layers of history that exist beneath our modern strides, forever imprinted on the corners that we so casually stroll past. <laughs>